Hi everyone, welcome back to the Cultural Competence and Communication for Week 10. Recap from last week, we looked at uh, culture shock. Culture shock is primarily a set of emotional reactions to the loss of one's own culture, new cultural stimuli lacking meaning and misunderstanding. So we looked at uh, migrants uh, as a, um, as a, one fa facet of culture shock, migration is the permanent relocation of an individual from one country to another. The number of migrants reached uh, 244, 244 million in 2015, as we saw. Looked at migrant uh, mental health, um, focusing on the fact that post-migration stress significantly influences the emotional well-being of refugees and often provides a risk similar to or greater than war-related trauma. Uh, we looked a bit, uh, as you'll recall, at the xenophobia and community, community perceptions, um, asking to what extent does mental illness reflect culture shock on the part of migrants, and inquiring as to how might we deal with that constructively. I'll leave that with you to ponder. It's an ongoing uh, project, I think. A uh, week before that, Looked at uh, critical pedagogy, communication accommodation theory, which uh, played into questions of migrant mental health and uh, community perceptions of, arguably, and uh, gender identity and hegemony as issues of cultural studies. This week, uh, we're looking at the second part of uh, two lectures on culture shock. Um, this week, we uh, will focus on Culture shock for Westerners is an aspect of travel and education abroad. As questions relating to this theme, will uh, this uh, lecture will uh, consider uh, what do we have to gain from international travel? What kind of work situations might involve opportunities to extend the cultural competence? Which I'll say is in the first one. How might education settings in particular aid this process? What are students likely to experience in spending a summer studying abroad, especially in countries where English isn't the first language? And is feeling like a foreigner in a strange land typical of people from English-speaking countries? Why and why not? And uh, what can we make of that? So those are the questions for today. Today's key concepts, culture shock. Uh, culture shock two for travellers, education abroad and working abroad. So let's get into it. Let's start off with uh, culture shock. Uh, for travellers, culture shock is the shock of the new. It implies that the experience of the new culture is an unpleasant shock or surprise, partly because it is unexpected and partly because it can lead to a negative evaluation of one's own culture. Uh, culture shock is also known as cross-cultural adjustment, being that period of anxiety and confusion experienced when entering a new culture. It uh, affects, that's a typo, it affects people intellectually, emotionally, behaviorally, and physically, and is characterized by symptoms of psychological distress. Culture shock affects both adults and children. This is a uh, commentary on culture shock, for, culture shock for travelers. I'm sure you'll notice that it's uh, almost identical to the uh, culture shock experienced by migrants and refugees. The experience uh, of shock is the same regardless of whether you're coming or going. Uh, a few graphics just to uh, um, help uh, uh, get the gears turning. Uh, first one is a standard graphic you uh, found in a, a, a Google image search. 10 reasons to travel. Why do people travel in the first place? To learn, to have adventures, adventures to be anonymous, because life is too short, to meet people, to feel more alive, to know yourself, to challenge yourself, to experience cultures, to not look back and wonder what if. Um, I'm sure you can find a few that you relate to there. Um, people travel for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, getting out of the uh, getting out of the comfort zone, uh, you know, extending the, the broadening the horizons. Um, but we find uh, in this second graphic in the uh, top right, when we do get out of the comfort zone, we uh, often tend to experience uh, the broad spectrum of neg negative emotions, disoriented, unclear, confused, lost, 
I'm sure, perplexed, bewildered. Um, all of which fall under the rubric of culture shock. Uh, underneath the, the signposts, we have uh, a graphic demonstrating the uh, stages of culture shock. Uh, the honeymoon phase, we start off, then uh, anxiety when you're out of your comfort zone, adjustment to the new circumstances, and then acceptance. With the uh, echoes of the DMIS here. How do we tell when culture shock is happening? The following can be symptoms of culture shock. Being overwhelmed by small problems, boredom, excessive sleep, eating or drinking, feeling overly shy, insecure, lonely, sad or vulnerable. Uh, a lot of uh, these, to me, these sound like uh, similar to symptoms of depression, uh, withdrawn, not eating, uh, headaches and other pains from stress, homesickness, hostility or excessive criticism of the host culture and idealizing your home culture. It's almost like a stage two reversal. Irritability, especially towards people from the host country, obsession, obsession with health and cleanliness. And here's the clincher, I think. Withdrawal and feelings of isolation or helplessness. So, you know, I mean, all, uh, all symptoms of stress in one form or another, even when we're under pressure, we uh, withdraw as a, as a defense mechanism, if not uh, physically, then, then certainly emotionally. Uh, a few more demo graphic demonstrations of, of culture shock. There's the, we've got the one up the top, which you'll recognize from, from last week. The pre pre preliminary stage, the initial euphoria, irritability, uh, re-entry phase when you come home, adaptation, cultural adjustment. A uh, slightly more complex one underneath. Uh, one, you leave, everything is new, interesting, exciting. Two, differences become apparent and irritating. Problems occur and frustrations it's in. Three, you may feel homesick, depressed, or helpless. Four, you work through, through culture shock and begin to adapt to your host culture. Five, you see your host country as your new home. In the returning home phase, six, you are excited about returning home. Seven, you may feel frustrated, angry, angry or lonely because friends and family don't understand what you experienced and how you changed. Eight, you readjust your life at home. Nine, you integrate what you learned and experienced abroad in your new life. So we get that uh, culture shock is a part of traveling abroad as a thing. Let's let's focus a little bit more on what happens when we come home. This, uh, this stage is six, seven, eight in, uh, in this graphic. So what we're talking about here is reverse culture shock. Uh, reverse culture shock is the process of returning and reabsorbing into one's own home culture after living in a different culture for a significant period of time. People experience re-entry in different ways. Some may experience few effects of re-entry, while others show problems ranging from a few months to a year or longer. And uh, the author of the article that this information comes from, uh, Sadika, uh, argues that no returnee is exempted from reverse culture shock. So it seems like there's a two-stage process of uh, cultural adaptation is the process of going when you're in the host country, the stages one, two, three, four, five, and then uh, the process of reintegrating your changed self back into your home society when you get home, the stages six, seven, eight, and then, uh, and then nine, once you readapted. So a few uh, graphic representations of reverse culture shock. I've got the traveler up the top returning home full of new experiences and insights to, uh, an audience which is apparently preoccupied with partying and uh, generally oblivious. Down the bottom, we've got a uh, cartoon. How was your va vacation? Obviously American. How was your vacation? Life-changing, but now I'm so depressed. I miss everything about it. Sounds like you've got reverse culture shock. What's the cure? Book another huge vacation. Yay. Throw your hands up. When I saw this, uh, it made me think of the experiential learning model. Surely this is a feature of the uh, reflection discussion stage. Uh, you, you go through the, uh, you conceive of, uh, of a travel experience, you uh, apply it, you, uh, in, uh, in planning, going to the travel agent, you experience, you go on the holiday, you come back with your reverse culture shock and you, you process what you've learned and how you've changed and then the, the, the cycle begins over again according to this model. Uh, another graphic representation of, of this, this, this process, this uh, adaptation to culture shock, more of a map of the, uh, the um, processes and the dynamics in play. 
In the middle we've got the cultural intelligence, which we are working on building here, and uh, which can be built further through uh, uh, application of the experiential learning model to experiential learning experiences. Uh, we go on, uh, we travel, we go overseas, we experience culture shock, which gives rise to psychological adaptation, socio sociocultural adaptation, and uh, so too with reverse culture shock, which uh, um, give rise, coming and going to greater cultural intelligence. So these are, these are influences and forces um, at play. So let's uh, think about some of the practical applications of overseas travel um, education abroad. Student exchange is one of the is these days a common feature of secondary and tertiary study as the world becomes increasingly interconnected. Employers seek individuals with an in intercultural mindset who can interact effectively, act effectively and appropriately with people from diverse linguistic and cultural backgrounds. Schools and universities are looking to facilitate this demand by developing study exchange programs to produce global ready graduates. What are the qualities that are promoted by student exchange programs? We've got, uh, obviously, intercultural competence. Global second language, uh, self-efficacy. You go to somewhere where they don't speak English, you're going to uh, um, develop your second language skills. Global mindedness, just being aware of um, how big uh, the world actually is and uh, where, we, uh, where we sit in that... Uh, in that big world, confidence to initiate and sustain interactions in a second or third language. Again, this is your second language self-efficacy -effic coming in and the ability to thrive in diverse environments. I mean, this is part of your uh, uh, adaptive, building your adaptive skills. So a quote from uh, Hunter quoted below on uh, defining global competence as a feature of the uh, qualities promoted by student exchange programs. Having an open mind while actively seeking to understand cultural norms and expectations of others. Levering this gained knowledge to interact, communicate and work effectively outside one's environment. Well, this is a, a largely a goal of this unit as well. So we're working at the common purposes there. If you decide to go on student exchange, which you definitely should look into, uh, some of the factors that, uh, excuse me, will influence success or failure in this respect can include variations in expectations, sojourn goals, attitude towards the host culture and language, degree of openness, willingness to communicate in the host language, individual personality characteristics, your, e.g. your degree of extroversion, external elements, e.g. Uh, orientations, ongoing support from the host institution and housing arrangements. So you have uh, going with uh, high expectations and they're not met, you're, you're going to be disappointed. You go in with uh, reasonable exp expectations, uh, you find uh, things will probably work better for you. So, uh, sojourn goals, holiday goals, trip goals, uh, setting goals is probably a good start. Uh, those who Fail, don't uh, plan to fail, they fail to plan. So you're planning, you're setting goals, you you have uh, things to work to work towards. Uh, you have structure, structure to the trip. Uh, attitudes towards the host language and culture. I mean, if you go in with a positive attitude, um, I mean, attitude is always key. Going with a positive attitude, you're gonna have a, a good time. If you go with a bad attitude, you can guarantee you're gonna have a, a bad time. And this influences your degree of openness. I mean, if you go in with a closed mind, you very definitely going to have a bad trip. I mean, this uh, um, influences your willingness to communicate. I and mean, if you're if you're not willing to communicate, I mean, it's just uh, it's just going to happen. So, you know, um, if you if you do do something like this, uh, key key things to keep in mind. Uh, here's a random image of happy student exchange uh, participants. Uh, there are. Links down at the bottom if you're interested in looking in, into student exchange. Uh, there's a, I haven't formatted this very correctly, but uh, you, sh you should be able to still, I mean, just get onto the website and exchange, uh, student exchange or international exchange. There, it's all there. 
and uh, studentexchange.org.au. So a couple of avenues to start looking into doing student exchange if, uh, if you're interested. You def very definitely should. And as you'll see, there are, um, for, for work reasons later, there are even, there are, there are very good reasons for looking into it. So let's look quickly at uh, working abroad. Uh, working overseas allows for the development of similar strengths to student exchange in a specific work context. Uh, the British Council, who uh, organise uh, migration student exchange to the UK, asked employers in nine countries how they view the role of intercultural skills in the workplace. Uh, the result of this survey was a report called Culture at Work, which you can access at the, the link on the screen. Uh, well worth looking into if you're, if you're thinking to take uh, your, your BA or your BIS or your Bachelor of Social Sciences overseas. No reason why you can't. So uh, do take a look at that. Uh, quote from uh, Culture at Work. Intercultural skills are of key importance to employers. That employers value intercultural skills as highly as formal qualifications. There's uh, there's something to keep in mind. I recognise the tangible business benefits of having a workforce which, with such skills, and see the clear risks associated with employees lacking them. I mean, if that isn't if that doesn't tell you something about the the benefit of uh, working overseas and getting a overseas uh, travel adaptive skills, then uh, I don't think anything does. Again, there's a further links down the bottom to um, for more information, so do check that out. Um, having the, the inter, it's uh, obviously having that, like the, you know, the, uh, the education, the inter intellectual knowledge is only part of the process. I mean, uh, you know, having the, um, the, the intercultural skills is obviously key. Uh, which uh, and with you know this uh, this process process that you go through with uh, with culture shock and then reverse culture shock, and uh, you know the knowledge and insight that comes from from dealing with those those reactions. So as we see here, student exchange and working holidays both have value then in terms of developing intercultural competence and the kinds of skills and aptitudes in dealing with diversity. Many employees employers are these days seeking. It is clear, however, that engaging in either or both brings within their own challenges in terms of navigating the experience of travel and making sense of it. I haven't done any uh, uh, guest speakers this uh, uh, this semester, which um, I do apologize for, but I'm going to now bring in something which uh, hopefully you might even find better. Uh, I'll let you be the judge, as I, as I said on Moodle. Um, I sent some interview questions to two very good friends of mine who've been uh, traveling through Asia and the Americas. Over the past few years, they spent a year working in Vietnam and uh, now they're in Mexico, in uh, uh, just outside of Mexico City, I believe. Uh, the, the name of the place uh, escapes me just in a second, but uh, they're t uh, teaching uh, ESL in, uh, in Mexico now and uh, they were very uh, kind enough to make a, uh, a video, which I will now play. Uh, the uh, the video is in the uh, PowerPoint slide, which you can download from Moodle. Uh, I will not play it here, I'll have to splice it in. Hi, my name is Kat. And my name is Gar. And uh, Ben has asked us to um, talk about what we've been doing for the past few years. Um, so we uh, have been working in different countries. Um, first, we worked in Vietnam uh, for about a year, mm -hmm. and uh, now we are living in Mexico, and we've been here for about a year, and we're English teachers. Mm -hmm. So um, we both had lived in Australia mm -hmm. at first. I lived there for six years, but I'm originally from uh, California in the USA. Mm -hmm. And I've lived there most of my life. My family is Australian, um, but I grew up in Papua New Guinea and moved there when I was 12. Yeah. So um, Ben's asked us some questions to answer, so I'll read the first one. Uh, can you describe your initial experiences of encountering cultural differences in places like Vietnam and Mexico? Could you talk a little bit about the kinds of everyday issues you might have, uh, might have had navigating around for everyday things like shopping, laundry, and getting things like housing, work, and travel organized. Um, basically, how have we dealt with that? Yeah, well, 
I think the first thing you notice when you're in a new country and you're living in a new country is that all of the things that you take for granted um, are, are usually turned on their head. Uh, things that are cheap and widely available in your home country are often not in the new country you're living in. Uh, and conversely, some things that were fabulously exotic <laughs> and not that available in your home country can sometimes be really cheap and widely available. Um, at the moment, for example, corn tortillas and good quality limes, really cheap. And avocados. avocados. <laughs> yeah, and mezcal as well. <laughs> yeah, um, for example. Um, but it's also, I think, Day-to-day -day living is, is the thing that really challenges you when, you when you first move to another country because interactions, simple interactions, uh, you really have to think about um, organising things like the laundry or the shopping is something that requires a lot more involvement. Um, and at every possible stage of interaction, you're, you're thinking about what you have to do, what the, the best way to respond is, what's polite, what is maybe impolite. Um, where, when you're in your home country, you take a lot of this for granted and you can sort of breeze through these, these yeah. everyday activities. It's all about routines. I mean, um, in Australia, there's a routine. In the USA, there's a routine. And I think in Australia, I had to get used to it. Um, but then when you go to a different country that English isn't, where English isn't the first language, you're dealing with a language barrier um, as well as just a completely different way of doing these basic tasks. Um, here, we, when you want to have your laundry done, uh, there's no laundry mat. You have to take the laundry to a place and then they weigh it and then they take it from you and you pick it up the next day folded and pressed, um, which is nice, but you know, the first time you're like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. And it's, and it's not cheap. It's, no, I mean. You can't do that forever. No, it, yeah. Then you find someone with a, a laundry machine so you can use it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and like what you were saying, Garth, it's just everyday normal things. And mm -hmm. at first, it just takes so much energy to to find out where to get your vegetables, uh, what stores are good for coffee, uh, which cafes are good for coffee when you need you need one. Um, so I mean, when you get to a new place, you just have a, a list of basics that you need to meet. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you can start enjoying the other aspects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when we were in Vietnam, I organized the housing. Um, and that took a lot of research. You have to go on forums to ask questions. Is this something that's done under the table with like on a website search engine like Gumtree? Or do you have to do it in a more formal way? And so we depended a lot on the advice of other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's... Probably the most important point. This, I think, would be true for many people who are living in new countries. Um, the support of people who already live there, who either share your experience or are friendly and willing to, to help you and make space for you, and allow you to be a foreigner and allow you to get things wrong. Be awkward. <laughs> be awkward and then eventually get over it. It's that sort of generosity and that willingness to um, let you learn and make mistakes. That's really essential, I think, for any um, any recent migrant to a country. Mm. Um, and even as visitors, too. Yeah, so. definitely. Um, okay. Uh, next, question. next question. Did you have any particular experiences of culture shock? If so, what were they and how did you handle them? Okay, so culture shock... We sort of talked about this. It's it's like it's not really a, a shock, you know. It seems like everything can be a shock uh, when you're in a new country, um, but you know, it's just all of a sudden everything you know is quite different. And so you, if you go in with like no expectations, then you kind of can slowly build up what your world is. Mm -hmm. um, and then after some time, you get confident, and then you know, eventually there's something else that surprises you. So it kind of goes in a wave pattern, I think. Yeah, I mean, to take your point about expectations, I think um, having had the experience when I was 12 of moving from one country to another country and experiencing the full 
blast of uh, disruption to your life and, and just having to relearn everything. Uh, and I did that a couple of times when I was growing up, moved to different countries with my family. And so I think in this case, I was a little prepared for weirdness and shocks and things to be different. Um, in places like Vietnam and Mexico, because I didn't know those countries that were going to be completely new to me. So I went in thinking, okay, you know nothing, everything's going to be weird and difficult, let's see what happens. Where I didn't do that was the United States, uh, when we were visiting your family for a few months. And I think I'd assumed that it would be really similar to Australia. Uh, you know, we've all seen American films, we watch a lot of American television, all of us in our lives. You know me. <laughs> I know you, <laughs> you're American. Um, so I just assumed it would be, you know, beyond a few language differences, more or less the same. And it really, really wasn't. Um, there were so many things where I was just confronted with how alien I was in that environment. Because um, you were relaxed. You I know? was relaxed. And this, I think this was the thing. I had, I had far more assumptions in the United States. Politeness is completely different in the USA um, compared to Australia. Uh, little things like when you're having dinner with somebody, there's an expectation I learned in the United States that within the first couple of minutes of eating that somebody in the group, one of the guests, will praise the host for their dinner. It's not like in Australia where you might say, thanks for having us round or thanks for dinner. Um, within five minutes, somebody has to say, oh, you know, Carol, this is the... this." Casserole is delicious, and everybody goes, "Yes, yes, it's wonderful." It's true. And you know, I I was kind of confronted by all of these little experiences every day, and I wouldn't be doing these things, and you would have to be sort of nudging me, going, "You need to say thank you for this," <laughs> or you you know, we ought to bring this around to the house. And I guess also just to, sorry, just to finish the point. I think in the USA, there's an expectation that English language speakers from other Western countries would share these habits already, and we don't. Mm -hmm. Where in Mexico and Vietnam, we're foreigners, and everybody yeah. expects you to get things wrong and to not understand it. There's so more given, leeway. <laughs> or a longer grace period yeah. in which to catch up. And I think like now, for example... They people, expect us yeah. to know things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's been a year. Yeah. I think also it's interesting because there is a difference between arriving as a, a traveller and I think we'll talk about this later, but a traveler, a tourist, and then someone mm -hmm. who's more integrated. And uh, because you were there with me and in my family, right. you were seeing a layer of the USA that most tourists don't get to see. Right, and I had been to the USA as a tourist, and of course, was spared all of this. You yeah. Know, you skim across the surface. <laughs> but when you're in the guts of it, then you have to do all these extra things. <laughs> then you're being, you're being assessed by the aunts and Everybody. the grandmothers. And, and, yeah. So it's different. I was going to say one thing that mm -hmm. I find really interesting about, or I found interesting, was just like public transport in different countries. Um, in Vietnam, you know, you get on the bus, same here. Mm -hmm. You get on the bus and you're just, you just got to go in a line. There's someone that's like lining you up in the bus where you, you have to all be in a straight line so that it can be packed as much as possible. And the conductor's kind of shuffling people mm -hmm. and making sure you're not taking up too much space. And it barely stops for like a second. And, yeah. you know, course, no safety. You're lost. You're kind of like, <laughs> like this. And same with Mexico as well. Yeah, for so. sure. I, uh, that sort of stuff is confronting, um, and then you get used to it. Yeah. I think little things like ev everyday stuff like this can be really mm. shocking <laughs> and funny. Um, so the next question. Mm -hmm. So um, when we were finally settled in places like Vietnam and Mexico, uh, did we notice our way of relating to our environment writ large or changing or evolving? And if so, to what extent do you feel that entering one unknown environment and coming to terms with it prepared us for the next one? This sort of relates a little bit to what I was saying before about the way I grew up. Um, because with, with my family, we moved. We lived in Papua New Guinea, we lived in Australia, we lived in the Netherlands. So I had this experience a few times growing up. But I don't think you ever really get used to the idea of being in a new place. You are maybe more prepared for the experience of going through um, going through this adjustment period 
So you're a little more mentally prepared, but you do still get caught off guard. And I think the, the big thing that I have kept relearning is that you can't know what your assumptions truly are until you're confronted by something that you didn't expect because they are the real assumptions. <laughs> the ones that you can notice and think, well, I assume this before I'm going in, it's not really the core deep um, values or, or ways or perspectives that you might have on the world that you don't question. Those things are confronted um, at some point usually and that's when you realise that you've just you've just uh, simply overlooked uh, something and, and you had no idea that other people in the world could see this differently or do it differently. Mm. I was going to say, there's also just a skill set of, of traveling uh, that you kind of get used to, um, either if you're traveling by yourself or with a partner. But we learn like when you get to a new country and you haven't eaten, you know, don't talk to each other <laughs> until you eat and feel better. Um, you know, there's just like you, you get somewhere and you say, okay, We've got to first find Wi-Fi, and then we have to find um, how to get a SIM card for our phones. And hopefully you will have booked accommodation already, so you find your hostel. And then if you're going to stay a while, you start researching as to where you can go to get your house. So there's like a pattern. And once you've done it once, you kind of know what you need to do in what order. But that, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's the pattern, say, of, of a tourist traveling from country to country, but that's a bit different from the pattern of having to adjust to living when you, for example, the reason why we live in Mexico now and not in Vietnam is because we were concerned about the level of pollution in Hanoi and you also wanted to be closer to your family in California and your friends. So we moved and coming into Mexico, it, it wasn't quite the same thing as when you're having this you know, adventure holiday time, exploring and, and uh, you know, feeling <laughs> feeling free. When you're coming in and you know you're going to be working and living and you're not setting yourself up for holiday adventures, you you ask, you still have this kind of checklist, but it's definitely well, different. Smaller. It's yeah, it's different, small. but you still want to get to your, like, we didn't have a house when we got here. We kind no. of... We had an interview. <laughs> right, an we interview. knew where the school was, and we had an Airbnb booked. But when you get there, you still need your Wi-Fi, and you still need to like just say where am I, mm -hmm. and then go to the next step, and then that just gets bigger and bigger. I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know. I think there is there are skills that you learn along the way that are kind of transferable. Sure, but I think I mean I think to answer the the question, the idea is really that. I mean, one of the joy, like the question about entering unknown environments and how that prepares you for the next. I think the thing I like about being in a new country is that you do feel like a child again. I don't know if you'd agree with this, but everything is new. For example, in the United States, this is one of the assumptions that I had made. I thought that having a shower would be easy. Right. <laughs> And in the United States, they have these weird handles and, and secret buttons and things you pull or <laughs> there's something you've got to twist. Yeah. It's not it's not what you would experience in Australia. And I would genuinely get lost. I felt demented standing in these showers. Cat, cat, cat come and help me turn this. How do I turn this on? On the other hand, you know, it's similar to like um, when you go to the supermarkets in the USA, there are 50 different types of ice mm. cream. And um, there's also like 50 different types of faucet handles you can use. Uh, so yeah. they're all different. You know, they are different. Every house has a different mechanism. But, I mean, the, but <laughs> the, the point being that you're, whether it's public transport or whether it's trying to find food in a supermarket or whether it's, do you remember trying to find a can opener in Hanoi? Yeah, it was hard. Impossible. Because <laughs> and there's so, another assumption. People are not eating canned yeah. food as much. If this is a weird luxury item that yeah. foreigners look for. So the thing I like about it is suddenly you're paying attention to every everything detail. and it is like being a child again because you're learning You're learning mm. every single day and that is thrilling. And I think being more aware of that as you go into another country definitely prepares you, but you can't know the things that yeah, you're going to you just with. know. You know you need at least a week or two or three or be month. before you start working or, you know, going to school so mm -hmm. you can just like have that mental space mm -hmm. to deal with things and then sleep 
Because <laughs> it's stressful. It is stressful. Um, can you read the next? Yeah, one? of course. Okay. Uh, how do you feel that working uh, in a country differs from a trip where you play the role of a tourist? To what extent uh, does being able to interact with locals in a teaching and learning context give added depth and meaning to your intercultural experience? This is something we talk about a lot um, because we see ourselves as residents here and we have a residency card. We pay tax. We pay tax, you know, so we're here. Uh, and I think that mental difference, that, that, that um, paradigm, that shift from tourist, which we have done quite a bit of yeah. as well, into resident Resident. makes a huge difference it helps your relationships with um, your colleagues Uh, and I think it also you know the students take us more seriously because they know that we care about their home um, and they help us to integrate as well Mm -hmm. Um, in our classes we're able to talk about anything and so they share a lot of their experiences with us and teach us things about in this case, Mexican culture. Mm. Um, we share meals together <laughs> at lunchtime. So we're learning and we're socializing and then outside of class, uh, we have coffee, chatting clubs. All of our students are adults, so that means that you know it's appropriate to have friendships with our students. And it's really wonderful. Um, mm. And on the other hand, you know, you as a tourist, you're kind of fleeting in and out of a place. And then we've met a lot of people who are also residents mm-hmm. who don't integrate so much. No, it's true. And and that's something we try to do. Well, I think I mean I think it a lot depends on the the attitude you have when you enter into a country. If if you're entering into a country with the intention of spending an extended period of time there, either permanently or at least for a a longer period of time, you're much more likely to invest time in learning the language, um, for example, which we've, we've been doing here. Um, you're also going to invest time in getting to uh, understand and integrate with the um, just with the, the way of doing things here, for example, in Cuenavaca. So um, within a country, there are a, a set of norms that everybody kind of gets, and as a foreigner, you don't get. It takes a while to it get does it. It takes yeah. a long, long time. And I really, I don't know if, as a foreigner, you ever want get it one hundred percent. You might, if you've lived in a country for most of your life, get ninety percent of it. But there's just so many, there are just so many things that you take for granted that you can't know about until you've stumbled over it or you've made an ass of yourself and done something inappropriate. Well, also language. I mean, until you master the language, you're missing a lot of these double meanings in right. speak or different ways of joking with each other. Or, or I think we're missing a lot still. Oh, no, definitely, definitely. We've got so much more to learn, no question. But you, it, it is frustrating when you have to filter your expression to this relatively narrow range of expression and kind of... <laughs> offer this and i also think that um even though we do feel like we're learning a lot and integrating a lot as we talked about before um you know we're foreigners we we look like foreigners yeah and we're treated like foreigners still uh uh, just whether in a in a good i mean (laughs) people are very (laughs) friendly and everything like that but they do see us as people who are foreigners yeah and uh, they help us along (laughs) I feel like it's sort of like bit by bit you're allowed to um, integrate more. Uh, allowed to is an interesting choice mm-hmm. of words. It's not that people are unfriendly, but that it's, it's more that people assume either one, that you're not going to be here forever, or two, that you couldn't possibly understand something. Yeah. So it's, for example, I remember the delight. Vietnam. Vietnam's a classic example. Yeah, yeah, that was, we, yeah. The, the, the first time that we had conversation with our friends and we, I don't know, we commented about having caught a bus somewhere and gone to a shop or something, and, wow, you managed to do that all by yourself, you know, it's literally right. treating yeah. us like kind of children. But it's because there's we this... We are speaking like children. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you're, when you're trying to speak a foreign language and you're still learning, uh, obviously you do sound childlike at the beginning. 
Um, but also I think it's there's this sense that as a foreigner, there's so much you don't understand. Kind-hearted people from the country that you're living in will try and make things easier for you. Yeah. But the assumption is, of course, that you are somehow incapable. Incapable. Um, and that's why I think maybe it just takes a, a little bit of time to, for these things to open up and for you to integrate. Yeah, I mean, even still in Mexico, our friends are saying, you know, text me when you get home, which is nice, because they're worried that, you know, the Uber driver won't take us home. Or, you know, Something. things, it, there's always there, and oh, be careful, don't walk home by yourself. Be yeah. careful, be, you know, and I, they're, just, they're just looking out for us. Um, and, you know, it is smart to pay attention mm -hmm. to what locals say about yeah. how careful to be. Well, let's, um, this leads interestingly into the last mm. question. How would you measure the impact of spending years abroad in non-Western environments in terms of reflecting on your view of the world beforehand? What sort of perspective has it given you on the prevailing dominant culture in countries like Australia and our understanding of cultures other than our own? Right. <laughs> Heavy. Uh, that's a good one. Um, you know, like I, I I was saying like we're here and we are learning more and more every day um, but we still have an identity of being from our respective countries and after having gone back to the USA and then you know back to Australia back to the USA now Vietnam back here there you do get an interesting lens of your own culture um, you still see it in yourself and I think that it keeps changing because you know you have a resentment and then you kind of say well no there are good parts that I like as well um, so I don't know you're just always learning about yourself in the context of where you are and um, I don't know it, it, you kind of just lower all of your assumptions about your world. I, I remember moving to Australia when I was 12 and I was told when I was growing up you are Australian you are Australian my parents were Australian I didn't know Australia. Uh, I visited once in my childhood and I spent my whole childhood in Papua New Guinea and then moved when I was 12 to Australia and I found it a completely foreign country. And one thing that really frustrated me was the attitude that people had in Australia at the time towards New Guinea. And they treated it as if it was this barbarous mm. place full of you know, murderers and rapists. It sounds a bit like what I was hearing in the US about, about Mexico. Mexico. I mean, you know, the president himself has words to say about this. Yeah. And I found I found that really frustrating. And then after spending a long time living in Australia, you know, I got very used to living there and I kind of um, was more understanding of the worldview that Australians have. But the thing I think in particular that Australia suffers from is it, by default, the rest of the world for most uh, lifelong residents of Australia is a holiday destination rather than alternative uh, societies, alternative worlds that have been built oh, up. It's definitely true of the US as well. Yeah, for, well, <laughs> I mean, there's yeah, a bubble. I, I take your word for yeah. it. Um, so, I, you know, I'm reminded living outside of Australia again. Uh, of how many people live with different conceptions of how to order their lives, different sets of values about what matters and what doesn't. Um, and however entangled we are in global capitalism and all the problems that we face, climate change and everything else, um, the day-to-day -day living that most people experience, I think, while there are an enormous number of similarities and basic values, mm. there are distinct Differences. Yeah. And I, There's I, still differences, you know. Definitely. Like, despite, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And I think the thing I really am grateful for is that being in this position has forced us to, well, I'll say us, mm. I'm speaking for me, but I'm assuming it's the same for you, um, has forced us to, I don't know, recognize, uh, recognize that the places that we've come from are just somewhere in the world you know they're not everywhere and they don't they certainly don't contain <laughs> the best way the best way yeah, yeah. I, I mean there are some things that are done well in other places mm -hmm. and some things that are done worse 
and that changes from place to place, city to city, town yeah, to town. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in the USA, um, people really feel sorry for other countries. I mean, that's something that is that's something I hear in my friends and my family, mm. uh, sort of like, oh, why would you choose to leave? <laughs> and it's it's silly, <laughs> you know, it's silly because mm. there, I mean, there are many different ways to live, sure. um, and there are many things in Mexico that are much better than in the states. Healthcare for one, you know, God, God, yes. yeah, <laughs> you know, like that's a huge one. So it's just it, it is funny to just live it and sort of prove to everybody else that it's doable uh, and you know you're seeing the evidence before you of people who are living really good lives. Like yeah, that. and that's not to say that there aren't things, I mean you wouldn't want it, the reverse to something be true when yeah. you're just yeah, that's what I was slavishly saying. worshipping uh, foreign countries as being somehow superior to yeah. yours. Yeah, no, that's a good part. Um, well, for one thing, we've talked a lot about how luxurious it is to have um, sidewalks, pavements, <laughs> uh, footpaths, whichever word you want to use, yeah. um, that are uncluttered where you could walk along and not actually have to spend the whole yeah, time looking, looking at your feet. At <laughs> uh, that has taken on a kind of... Also running majesty. water that you can drink like from the faucet, that's right. a good one. But, but I mean, these are you can deal with it. Things. Yeah, you can deal with... Oh, that's what I was going to say. You can deal with anything. Mm -hmm. That's something that surprises me is that you know, when you're in a place that's easier, where you have running water that's clean and sidewalks, you kind of think, oh, why would I go somewhere where it's a bit more difficult? But people are quite resilient. <laughs> and when we travel, we prove to ourselves that we're very resilient, whether it's dealing with culture shock or mm. practical things. <laughs> you know, you, you can cope with anything, and that's quite empowering. I yeah. I think the, the last thing I was going to say, I just looked back at um, mm. The question just to remind me. We got off topic. But the last thing I was going to say is that I know there is a temptation also to um, be very critical about the dominant culture in one's home country. Um, goodness knows there's a lot about Australia that, you know, really, you know, I'm sure all of us share frustrations uh, about but the thing I'm reminded about living here and having been living in, in Vietnam recently is that virtually all of us take an awful lot for granted uh, most of the time and even when we think we're being critical and we think that we're attaining this perspective and, and, and really able to analyze something critically we're still missing things and there is more to be said for kindness and for people extending um, friendship and, and the chance for the, the space for people to make mistakes and to, to learn and for it not to be a fatal error mm. or to, to throw you outside of human community. Um, but maybe this is just me getting old and sentimental, I don't know. <laughs> but it's tempting to be critical about Australia, but I think that there, are, while there is a lot about the dominant attitude in Australia, which I feel is in need of correction, I also recognise the fact that um, a lot of it's simply born out of uh, the situation that people find themselves living in uh, down there. <laughs> so it's no surprise, you know. Mm. We we are we are creatures of our environment. Mm. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, that. I think. Yeah, you know, being seeing it your own country from the lens of far away is interesting, and you you do see just kind of mm -hmm. that sort of basic truth. I guess. No. <laughs> All right, All right we're done. We need to not. Yeah, I think that's talk that's anymore. Fine. I'll carve this up. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Bye, Ben. Like. Good luck. So that was uh, Kat and Garth. Um, we'll talk about this more online and uh, in the in the tute. If you're interested in knowing more about teaching English overseas, you can check out the ESL for the Certificate in Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages. For more information on CELTA, 
visit the Cambridge website at the link below or uh, they offered it at RMIT. I honestly didn't check to see if they offered it at Fed Uni. They may well do, but it's uh, certainly on offer at RMIT, so do check that out if you're uh, interested in uh, teaching ESL overseas and might even look into that myself. Readings for this week, uh, Jane Jackson, Preparing Students for the Global Workplace, some impact of a semester abroad. Uh, 30 students have uh, one on interculturality and study abroad experience. Uh, if you're at second years, if you're keen, look at that as well. There's some um, further what I recommended uh, reading as well, something from Bennett um, and a few others as well. So hopefully those should uh, give you a bit of uh, added insight. Your task for this week is the uh, Moodle quiz 3.4 that will be up till Sunday. And then uh, next week is your assessment task 4.5, the DMS, DMIS stage five adaptation. This is where we uh, shift from the acceptance stage, where we accept cultural diversity. We uh, leave the ethnocentric stage and enter the ethno-relative stage, or phase, rather, sorry. Uh, and once we have, uh, we've accepted cultural difference, we've uh, gone from cultural universal, universalism and this, this binary of self versus other to, uh, to into cultural relativism. Uh, we can, you know, we start to build on that. We uh, we accept that uh, cultural differences exist, and uh, in this stage, we uh, begin to look at ways to uh, to adapt the, the the host culture to uh, to accommodate uh, growing diversity. So that will be coming up on on Monday morning. I'll I'll post the uh, the thread for that online. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you uh, enjoyed the, uh, the the video from Cat and Garth. I was uh, really glad to to be able to to bring that in this week. Um, have a great week. I hope you're hanging there with all your, uh, your assignments and stuff like that. Uh, thanks for listening and uh, I will catch you again next week. Bye for now.